froze entirely during an ice age because a small and tenuous species arising in Africa as a quarter million years ago has managed so far to survive by book or crook. We may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. This explanation, though superficially troubling, I find, um, excuse me, I find, but eventually it is liberating and exhilarating. The question becomes, is an epistemological question. Without ethics being absolute, transcendent, because human beings are absolute and transcendent, we have no power and no reason to declare anything right or wrong. We stand at the fate of chance. Thank you. Now we'll each do a five minute closing. And I think to some extent, Jeremy and I are talking past each other a bit, so I just want to address uh, the one point. The question is, uh, from whom does morality come? And let me just make the point, I think this is a really important point, that our ability to reason and assess the consequences of our actions is independent of us as individuals or of a worldview. So the question of who decides the morality is not even a reasonable question because it's the reasoning itself and being able to assess the consequences of our actions that determines whether an action is moral. The moral morality emerges from the consequences of the action. It's completely independent of an individual or their particular worldview. My question in closing is, what is a psychopath? Well, according to the World English Dictionary, a psychopath is a, path is a person afflicted with a personality disorder characterized by a tendency to commit antisocial and sometimes violent acts and a failure to feel guilty for such acts. If God exists and the Bible is his word, then tell me why he is not a psychopath. Do you really think we should get our morality from a psychopath? Quote, Now therefore, kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman that hath known a man by lying with him. But all the women children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Numbers 31.17 If God exists, and the Bible is his guide for morality, what does morality mean? I return to Immanuel Kant. Did the Israelites consider, even for a moment, that the Midianite girls herded off into sexual slavery, slavery were anything more than a means for the pleasures of the soldier? Did God ever consider that young girls whose entire families had just been slaughtered in front of them would have any interest in loving, honoring, or cherishing the murderers? Kant, inspired by the pure application of reason and not religious doctrine was able to show us a better way over 200 years ago. Isn't it about time we took them seriously? How about we set aside the ancient text for a moment and realize that although we are perhaps, uh, excuse me, although they are perhaps the best we could have expected from ancient tribes, we have learned a lot in the last 2,000 years and we're ready to use what we've learned. Let me suggest an improved moral code. This is just a particular humanist Ten Commandments. There's many out there. This is one I found particularly compelling. Number one, proclaim the natural dignity and inherent worth of all human beings. Number two, respect the life and property of others. Number three, practice tolerance and open-mindedness towards the choices and lifestyles of others. Number four, share with those who are less fortunate and mutually assist those who are in need of help. Number five, use neither lies, nor spiritual doctrine, nor temporal power to dominate and exploit others. Number six, rely on reason, logic, and science to understand the universe and solve one's problems. Excuse me, solve life's problems. Conserve and improve the Earth's natural environment, <coughs> land, soil, water, air, and space in humankind's common, as humankind's common heritage. 
Number eight, resolve differences and conflicts cooperatively without resorting to violence or to wars. Number nine, organize public affairs according to individual freedom and responsibility through political and economic democracy. Number 10, develop one's intelligence and talents through education and effort. When we understand our evolved nature, when we appreciate and as needed challenge our culture, and when we commit ourselves to being rational in solving life's complex problems, we are all better for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to again thank uh, CUNY for this opportunity. I hope that this will not be an end, but a beginning again to discussing these issues. In my closing, I just want to say this. The famous Christian philosopher um, Francis Schaeffer forecasted the downfall of Western culture if we were going to continue to ride or give way to moral relativism. And as we've seen that, we have seen that. Now, although that is not always the case in a sense, but we are seeing the fact that if you study cultural history in a broad <coughs> scope of things, it's usually imploded from within. Today is an epistemological case. And again, I have not heard one bit of evidence, again, to ground reason without God. Because you see, we have to ground reason, logic, morality, with some type of absolute transcendent objective if it's going to work. Otherwise, morality reduces to personal preference. I like ice cream, you like ice cream. You maybe like torturing babies. Is that a matter of personal taste? What are we calling evil? This is not an atheist versus a Christian. If the Christian is true to the scriptures, this is God versus Satan. And that means this, is that Jesus came down, crossed the noumenal and phenomenal realm of Immanuel Kant, became the is and the solution to the is and ought problem of David Hume. Because you see, in a naturalistic materialist worldview, in chance, what is morality grounded by chance? That's the question that we must ask ourselves. In a universe of just blind physical force, Richard Dawkins, I've stated my case with atheist quotes. These are atheists. And as much as we want to try to smuggle it, everything that has been said today has been smuggled in, assuming that what Mr. Courtney has presented was objective and transcendent. And there's no grounds for that. That's what I've been trying to prove. Now, does that mean religious people are perfect and atheists cannot be ethical? Of course. But when it comes down to it, it comes down to a heart problem. And that heart problem can be cured by only one means, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came here to solve that problem. And it will take a change of heart. And it will take a person willing to surrender to the God of the universe who creates everyone in his image, which means the law says ultimately that you're sacred. Although there are mysteries and everything else, the gospel of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross is free and open to everyone by grace through faith. And just by merely putting your trust in him and repenting, that will not necessarily just ultimately make you a perfect person, but it will ground both epistemologically as well as existentially your reality and your sense, or what we would call source of morality. So, I just want to again, I want to thank you, but again, the question comes in this form. Who is going to borrow from whose worldview? What if ethics is not objective and transcendent? Are we going to journey to, in a sense? How are we supposed to behave if ethics are not objectively transcendent? And lastly, with God, He is the rational basis, 
and he makes sense of objective transcendent that is second that the